Uh, we're going to close out this evidence series that we've been in um, for quite a while now. Uh, we're heading into the summer. I'm sure you guys all have amazing plans for yourselves. Uh, we've got Vern, who's going to share a three-part sermon series with us this summer. We've also got Victoria and George sharing with us, so stay tuned for that. And then Jeff's got a, a fresh message for us next week, which I'm looking forward to. So there's lots, lots going on here this summer. Um, so if you'll remember back in September, uh, we started a, a series in the gospel, just kind of looking at um, what exactly is the gospel? Like what, what do we, when we say gospel, what, what actually is that? And kind of diving in deep and, and bringing some understanding to the gospel, the, the, the message of Jesus and his kingdom. And of course, after that, we headed into this series, which is looking at how the church, um, followers of Jesus, how we're, we are called to bring evidence of the good news of Jesus and his kingdom. And so the gospel, in a nutshell, just a really brief overview, because we have gone in this uh, you know, quite in depth in the past, but just to kind of skim the waters and the overall sort of overarching story of the gospel, is that God has come is that God has come in and through Jesus Christ, who is himself God. And God has come and he has um, dwelled among humanity and he has entered into our pain and our suffering, our situations and our circumstances. He's entered right into it and, and become human. And so Jesus' whole life is about uh, bringing the kingdom of God and, and setting up the kingdom of God on earth among humanity. I was, his whole life in ministry was about um, the kingdom. And then, of course, he goes to the cross, and he's crucified, and there on the cross is, is Jesus' enthronement. That's his, his exaltation. On the cross, he is installed as this suffering servant king. And then, of course, he is buried in the tomb, but he resurrects to new life, and he's this now conquering king over sin and death. He reigns above it all, this eternal king with an eternal kingdom, and all who come to him can have this resurrection life that he possesses and, and can enter into the kingdom and experience sort of this new creation life in him. And then, of course, the there's part of the gospel that we're still waiting for, which we talked about this morning a bit in worship, this new creation where Jesus will come and make all things new, where the glory of the Lord, the, the kingdom of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But right now his kingdom comes through the church, through um, Jesus' followers, through whom he has put his spirit and his presence in. So 2 Corinthians 4, 6 in the voice translation it says, the God who spoke light into existence, saying, let light shine from the darkness, is the very one who set our hearts ablaze to shed light on the knowledge of God's glory revealed in the face of Jesus, the anointed one. So here we're told God, the creator of all things, stepped into humanity through Jesus and revealed his glory, revealed who God is. So because Jesus is God, he is the only one who could reveal the knowledge of God, the character of God. Now this word knowledge in the Greek is this, it's this deep inner knowing. It actually is a, a personal experience. It's like this experiential knowledge. You know because you have um, experienced it yourself. And so the good news is that humanity can know and encounter the living God can encounter who he is and have this, this personal relationship, this close relationship with God and experience the life of Jesus and experience um, the life of the kingdom here and now. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So we've been reconciled to God, we've been brought close, we've been brought into his presence, and we have been made new. We are this, this new creation. God has been brought so close that his spirit resides in us and, and among us. But then there's this other part of the gospel, too, that we've been going over this past few months. In 2 Corinthians 5, 
It says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So we've been reconciled to God, and because we've been given this new life, because we've been given uh, the kingdom, because God is, is here within us, we are now these ambassadors. We are these, these representatives, like Jesus is, resides in us so that we can represent him to this world. So the, the church were called to give this evidence of, of the living God and give people an experience of, of what God is like uh, and what his kingdom is like. In 2 Corinthians 3, this is the voice translation again. It says, Now all of us with our faces unveiled reflect the glory of the Lord as if we are mirrors. So if we see Jesus as our Lord, as our King, the Messiah, the Savior, then the veil has been removed. God has removed the veil, and now we are like these mirrors, right? We're just we're reflecting Jesus reflecting the character of God and, and representing the king so that others can encounter Jesus through us. But, you know, I think about mirrors, and I don't really like them all that much sometimes. You know, mirrors can be tricky. Often I look in the mirror and I become my own worst critic. The way I view myself, the way I see myself, like I know who I am. I know my past, and I know my, my present sin, and I see my inadequacies and my weaknesses, um, the broken parts. I see the, the fallibility. And I often just think like, oh, I'm just, I'm not good enough. How could I be an ambassador? Who am I to be someone to represent Jesus, like, I don't see how this person here can provide evidence of who God is, of who the king of heaven and earth is. And maybe some of you struggle with those sorts of thoughts when you, the way we view ourselves, right? Like, how could God ever, ever work through me for his kingdom? Maybe we just focus on our past. My past is, is too shameful, I'm too weak, I'm too afraid, I'm not good enough, I'm not gifted enough, I'm not like, like that person over there doing all these amazing things for the kingdom. I'm unqualified and inadequate, and we just think of all our deficiencies and all the ways we fall short. I mean, you can just kind of enter in, fill in the blank with your shortcomings. If we read through the Apostle Paul, his letters, we will find that he was a very honest man. He was very honest with his past, and he was very honest with his present sort of struggles. In 1 Timothy, he says to the young pastor, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. He's like, I, I'm the worst of sinners. He's being really honest with himself and with Timothy in Galatians 1, he says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how I intensely persecuted uh, the church of God and tried to destroy it. Like people suffered at, at his hands. He calls himself a murderer and a violent man. He's got this really shady past. And then if we read through the letters to the Corinthian church, Paul is really upfront and honest about his inadequacies, his unqualifications, his weaknesses. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Down in verse 3, he says, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. He's like, I'm not this amazing, articulate preacher, and I'm not that captivating to listen to. I mean, if you read in the book of Acts, while Paul is preaching, a young man falls asleep in the window and plummets to his death. Paul's like, 
I'm not coming to you with like all this strength and confidence in myself and with, with, my, with my preaching. But then he goes and he calls out the church too in Corinth. And he says to them, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. He's saying, you're like, guys, a lot of you aren't that smart. And you're really a bunch of nobodies. Like, no one's looking to you for anything or thinks anything of you. Your family origins aren't that great. There's not really a whole lot to boast about there when it comes to yourself. So Paul's like, says to the church, like, I am weak. He confesses, I am weak. But then he says, but guess what? So are you. He lumps himself in with, with, with all these weak people. <laughs> but there's always a reason for Paul's honesty. In 1 Timothy, so if we read the rest of these verses, where he's like, I'm the worst of sinners, but then he goes on to say, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul's, yeah, I'm the worst of sinners, but it's for that very reason, because of my past, now Jesus can be displayed. God's mercy, his, his loving kindness, his patience can be known for those who would believe, who would come into the kingdom. Paul here is like, you know, he's this signpost. He's evidence of God's mercy and, and grace. He's evidence of, of the saving power of Jesus. He's evidence of God's character. So Paul's past only glorifies God and his abundant sort of borderless love that knows no limits and, and no bounds. Paul's like, my, my life, my past is evidence of the gospel and the goodness of God. And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 2, talking about some of his, his weaknesses, his struggles. And he says to them, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed you know, the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not wise and persuasive, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Again, here Paul's like, my weakness, my, my brokenness, my inadequacies, they, they point to the power of God. They point to a demonstration of, of who God is. They put God on, on display. And Paul here is like, I'm not the message. My accomplishments, how far I've come, I'm not it. But he says, Jesus is. To know nothing except Jesus and him crucified. And, and the gospel doesn't go forth in human strength and human adequacy. He says to the church after calling out their weaknesses, he said, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Paul here is like, you guys, you don't get it. Like, like your weaknesses, all that you've come to the table with is exactly how God is going to make himself known. It's exactly how God is glorified in this world and how the kingdom comes. For Paul, the church was never meant to be filled with a bunch of strong people who are qualified and extremely talented, a bunch of people who are sure of themselves and know how to get things done. The 
church is to be made up of people who are weak and unqualified and, and even broken. And it's because of this, it's because of our awareness of our own brokenness that we can connect with that deep need for God. Because who needs God when you're strong and you got it all together? Who needs God when you're qualified? When you're talented? We need God in our weaknesses. That's where the power of God is shown. And that's where we, we can rely on God. Like, I want to be a part of a church that relies on the Spirit and not what we can accomplish. <laughs> the world does not need a church that is full of themselves and self-reliant. The world needs a church that welcomes in the sinner and the broken and the weak. Because we are aware of it in ourselves. Because we know it exists in us as well. That's how we can extend mercy. I want to just clarify, there is a difference between being aware and being focused. So when you're focused on something, like that is all you see. You can't see past it. Um, it's kind of, it's just got your gaze. You're really honing in on it. And so we're not called to be focused on our weakness and our flaws and our sin, and our brokenness. We don't fix our eyes on our shortcomings, right? We fix our eyes on Jesus and all that he is, and not ourselves. But the gospel is about a Savior who has come right into the middle of it all, right into the middle of um, the world's brokenness, and weakness, and sin, and failure. The gospel is about a God who has come and meets us right where we are at, who doesn't demand that we clean ourselves up and get it together, and then we can come in. The gospel is about a God who just meets us right in the middle of it all. And so, so we, the church, we take this posture of humility in the world, aware of our broken bits, aware of our, our weaknesses. And so this way we can extend the loving kindness of God, because God has shown that to us. So in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul's speaking about the gospel, and he says, you know, God made light shine out of the darkness. He made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Then he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So he's talking about the glory of God, the presence of God, the power of God, God himself, this treasure being placed in us, these jars of clay. Like, we are fragile and vulnerable. That's what a clay jar is. It's, it's easily broken. If it were up to me, I wouldn't, put my most valuable things in a fragile vessel, right? I mean, think about something that you have that's expensive or a possession that's very valuable to you or something that you may hope to have. I mean, we like to put our stuff in a strong box behind lock and key, something that can't be tampered with, something that can't be broken or wrecked. We don't place our valuables in, in weak things, but God does. And this is how God has chosen for the kingdom to go forth. He's placed his treasure, his, his glory, all that he is, his life, his, his resurrection, his power, his presence has been placed in us, these fragile beings that are weak and, and can be broken. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul here has this thorn in the flesh. We're never really told quite... Uh, what it is, but we know it's something that impedes him. We know it's something that holds him back and causes him to suffer in a way. Or, or perhaps Paul would like to do more, but this is preventing him from doing so. 
And so he reaches out to God and he wants this, this thing taken away from him. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Paul's like, not only am I accepting this weakness that I have, this brokenness, but I'm actually going to flaunt it. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embrace it. I'm going to boast in it for the sake of Christ. Because then Jesus can be known. Because then I can experience God. I can experience God in my weakness. Like, God can be found in the weakness, in the brokenness. And that's where God receives the glory. And so, you know, we have these, these excuses or all of these reasons why we're unqualified, why we're not good enough, why we can't see the kingdom come through us. But God is like, that's exactly how the kingdom's going to come. Jesus is going to be displayed in that and, and through that. You know, when we can be a church that is open and, and honest and just be able to say to one another and to others, like, I'm not perfect. And I have broken parts and I have weak parts and I have um, fallible parts. But let me show you, let me tell you, let me provide you with evidence of the God who meets me there who loves me and accepts me and has welcomed me in and gives me his presence in all of that. Where we can, we can just admit that we are clay jars because when we're weak, then God's strength can be known. God's power can be known. And so we are a presence in this world um, who's like we're not strong and enforcing things or going forth in our, our own sort of power, but we're like, we are evidence of the power of God's love. Of the power of his saving grace and his mercy. So in Matthew 5, this is, you know, as Jesus is speaking to a crowd and it's the, the Sermon on the Mount, which we did a series in a couple years ago. And Jesus goes on to teach about the ways of the kingdom and, and what it looks like. And he says to this crowd that is listening, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I was just thinking as I was reading that, it, maybe my kids would maybe say it's cringy or cliche or something, um, cheesy maybe. <laughs> it's like, you know, a clay jar has got these broken bits and cracks. Like, that's where the light comes out, right? But light can't shine through a, a strong box. Light can't shine through something that's been hidden away. The light shines through the, the brokenness, and that's how the Father can be known. And here Jesus is speaking to an unlikely crowd. Back in Matthew 4, it says he went throughout Galilee teaching in the synagogues and talking about the kingdom, and he was healing their diseases and their sicknesses. News about him spread, and people were brought to him who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from all over the region. Now, these are outcasts. These are the weakest and, and most powerless in society. Those that others wouldn't um, think to look to or, or that were good for anything. And here Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world. Those who mourn, those who are poor, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they have suffered at the hands of injustice. In 2 Corinthians 
3, Paul says, not that our, we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. I love the way the voice puts it. Don't be mistaken. In and of ourselves, we know we have little to offer, but any competence or value we have comes from God. So Paul's like, I'm not claiming anything for myself here. I'm not trying to show you my strengths. I'm trying to show you who God is. And I'm trying to show you his power and, and his kingdom. This, this relying on, on God. Every message that we've been in throughout this series is, is based upon the, the reliance of the Spirit. And we're not focusing on everything that we are not, but we are focusing on everything that he is and that he provides. We're focusing on his power. In 2 Corinthians, um, in the message, Paul says, so we're not giving up. How could we? We're not throwing in the towel. We're not counting ourselves out of this thing. He says, even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace, his empowering presence. Now, these hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye, far more here than we are kind of focusing on. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see now will last forever. So Paul's like, we're, we're going forth. We're, we're moving ahead. We're not counting ourselves out. We're going forth in, in the power of God, and we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus and his kingdom. And we're going to set our sights on the renewal of all things, on new creation. When everything is restored, when everything is made new, when all things are made right. But meanwhile, right here, in the midst of the broken, in the midst of the weak, there's evidence of new creation in us. New creation is coming forth like where these wellsprings. New creation can be found in the followers of Jesus, right where we're at. Even in those seasons that we, that we just maybe don't want to be in or wish we never went through. In 2 Corinthians 3.18 the message again says, there's nothing between us and God. Our faces shining with the brightness of his face. And we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually become brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. So part of the gospel is that there is renewal. There is restoration. Like we're not stuck. There's joy for our mourning. There's beauty for our ashes. And God makes things new and God heals uh, the brokenhearted, and there's so much um, beauty and newness that comes into our lives, and, and God shapes us and molds us to become more like him. But here in this, this part of our lives, there's always going to be something that is broken. There's always going to be just bits of us that need to be made whole, like we're on this continual journey and we're just not going to reach this climax or, or reach this state of perfection until we see Jesus face to face, until the renewal of all things. So we can embrace the imperfections now. We can embrace the weakness and the brokenness now. And we can hope for renewal and we can hope for restoration now as well. But right here, where we're at, God meets us and our lives testify to this God who is powerful and mighty and strong and beautiful and loving and gentle and kind. Who brings life out of death, who brings joy out of misery. And so I like to think in these terms of of just accepting my weaknesses and my inadequacies and relying on God because it just really takes the pressure off. Like I think about, you know, pastoring a church or just in my everyday life, even being a, a mom or being, being out in the world. Like I don't have to force anything. 
And I don't have to like bolster myself and become this, this presence of strength in the world. Like the pressure's just off. I can rely on God. And that's actually the best thing because then he can be known. I'm not pointing people to myself, but to God. Pete Scazzaro says that God sees our weakness and vulnerability as a gift and the source of our greatest strength in him. God built brokenness and weakness into the fabric of all life when he set in motion the consequences of the fall. He did this so that our weakness would drive us to seek him and recognize our need for a savior. Like, I just think it's, it's good to be broken. It's good to be weak sometimes because that's where we reach out for God. Like, we want to be a needy church. I want us to be a needy church. A church that knows that we are, we're nothing without his spirit, without his presence, without his power. I'm going to pray for us. Jeff's going to come up as well. Um, yeah. I just pray, Spirit, that this morning there would be a sense of just this acceptance of who we are and where we're at right now. And in, in that place, there's hope for, there's hope for more. But just that right where we're at in this very space, in this very season of our lives, that we could just be okay and rest in you. And even, and even that we would say, okay, okay to you, Lord, like how, how do you want to meet me in this place? How do you want to meet me in this brokenness? Or how do you want, how do you want to show this world who you are through my weakness? Help us to see you in all of that. And, and I pray that we would just be this church that is so needy, so hungry for you, so desperate for you. And that we would see your power. And we would see your kingdom come.